horror, a genre that's defined to make you scared, to make you fearful, and to make you dread and fear of what might be lurking in the darkness or behind the shadows, to really give you that good scare. Now I myself tend to dabble a little bit now and again to watching a lot of the horror media, in particular a lot of interesting ones. And when it really gets you, when it really gets you a good scare or a good jump, or even just like, it really makes you think on some stuff, a really well done mix of it, it can really stick with you. Some of those like classics you can see over time, like the Friday the 13th, The Exorcist, Nightmare on Elm Street, or Halloween, to even more no recent ones like The Conjuring films, Get Out, Quiet Place, or even the likes of X and Pearl, to even shows like Haunting on Hill House, Blind Manor, or even some Ghost Hunter shows you're interested in that, and to games like Resident Evil, Amnesia, Silent Hill, Outlast, and even Alien Isolation, just to name a few, that would really stick with me and defy themselves as some really good media. But what if it's a case of an instance where it's horror, but the opposite of good? Now, there is an emphasis a lot of time that horror can be subjective to people, that it could be much harder for them to be scared by stuff, if they've basically been glued to so much stuff and talking about being scared by things, that the fear of it basically loses is all meaning. But I'm not talking about more case of like the sort of films that kind of are try to make it challenging for you to be scared. More a case of the horror of this film is why were these made? Now initially I was going to talk about why horror was a mixed bag or about the analog horrors are much scarier but I might leave them for another time because this one was brought up to me by a special someone and it was basically the emphasis of what is the worst horror film you've probably ever watched. Now I'm one that gives a benefit of doubt for a lot of movies of course and I actually think I like a lot of decent things but then I really thought about a case of movies that came out this year which we had a fair mix of some decent ones like Talk to Me, Megan and Evil Dead Rise. There's some more mixed ones like Boas afraid and to a little bit of a mixed reception from critics like the ex believer as a time of recording five nights at freddy's but it was more a case where there was two films from this year both in the genre of horror that really just missed the mark and today in the spirit of halloween while i'm also going to dress up like so we're going to be talking about two of the worst movies of this year where i'll be splicing in some footage of me watching it for the first time and at the end of it, basically going through the entire story and giving my review of things and like how I score it and the impact it basically has afterwards. So join me, while you will, for this Halloween episode of Horror Most Bore, the two worst horror films of 2023. Oh, bother. Hey, everyone. Uh, just a little update just before this little first section here talking about Blood and Honey. I did initially have clips for this one. I had like just reactionary clips talking of me watching the film and reacting to it. However, the file that I had basically got corrupted just on those little clips and I tried to get a new version of it, but apparently it expired. I put it for weed transfer just basically because it was such a big file size thing. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to find some of the clips. At least I could talk about some of the clips anyway and throw it in there. I do still have the ones for Dear David, which I'm going to throw on there later on while I'm editing this piece. And yeah, I apologize. I should have done better. I should have probably updated it, should have got like a backup one of it as well, put it on my hard drive, but it's been a busy week. I'll tell you that now. But anyways, uh, I still hope you enjoy this video anyway. And uh, yeah, let's just get on to the piece. Let's just get on to the first part of the video, which we're talking about a sadistic, silly old bear. So before I go into depth on this very mixed mess of a film, which this first instance is We the Pooh, Blood and Honey, I want to give a quick background to both the character as well as how this film came to be before I dive into my thoughts and how the film plays out. So Winnie the Pooh started out as a character created by the author of A.A. A. Mill, who based most of the characters on the Hundred Acre Wood and the human boy Chris Robin off of his young son and his toy animals. And what followed was a beloved collection of stories of a little but clumsy and forgetful bear who loves his honey and shared adventures with Piglet, Owl, Tigger, Rabbit, Kangaroo, Eeyore, the Heffalump, and of course, Chris Robin himself, and lead to a worldwide success, merch items, and the creation of animated films and series from Disney. And that's how he's known today. Now, I bet you're wondering then, why the hell did Pooh Bear go from a lovable bear to a fucking serial killer? Well, the reason for this is basically because of a thing known as 
public domain. You see, over time, a copyright for a certain character will basically, you know, expire. And if you don't renew the contract, it basically means that a character becomes public domain so that people can use it without being copyright claimed by a certain company or author or publisher. It basically goes back to the original rights owners or most emphasis. So what basically followed then was about a year ago, images started popping up on the internet of this really more sadistic looking Winnie the Pooh. Now people thought this was kind of like a really well in-depth AI image, but it turned out to be an actual new horror film be made by British filmmaker of Ray's Frank Warfield, who had worked on a lot of different films based on seasonal events and other fictional characters, and he caused quite a discussion when they first released online of how something so wholesome would be turned into a sadistic serial killer. Now things would be quiet for a bit up until it was announced for a release in the new year, and even a limited cinema release, and that is where we find ourselves today with talking on this mixed bag of a film. Now before context of what the plot is, of I'm gonna delve plot through, I'm gonna give a quick summary of what this film is about. Transfer Transformed and feral and bloodthirsty, after being left abandoned, Winnie the Pooh and Piglet terrorize Christopher Robin and a group of young women in a remote house. Now the likes of it are you thinking, okay, seems fair and reasonable. There's something with this, but when you really delve into it, it does come out as a lot and how everything turns out really just feels like a waste of potential and may have needed more time to be properly fleshed out. Now this, of course, I'm going to go into spoilers now, so let's get into talking of what this film really plays out like. Just basically off the bat, the narrative of this film really is all over the place and leaves a lot of questions afterwards that has little to no resolution or reasoning, but I'll get to those points when I'm there. So the film starts with a backstory about how Chris and Robin one day, while exploring the Hundred Acre Wood, came across these animal-human cross species-like creatures in the woods and consisted of basically of five characters of Owl, Rabbit, Eeyore, Piglet, and of course, Pooh. Now other characters like Tigger were still in their copyright laws, they couldn't really use them, but I'll talk about them later. And they spent nearly every day playing together, or him bringing them food, up until he had to go off to college and left them there alone. Now this led to a very harsh winter that nearly killed them off very quickly from hunger, and an event that traumatized them that they decided the best course of action to survive was for one of them to be eaten by the rest, which in this case was Eeyore. And from this, and from doing this made them agree to a vow of silence of never speaking to it, speaking again, as was well a case of vowing revenge against humanity. That's basically how it all starts off. Now we jump forward a few years later and Chris and Robin has returned to the woods with his girlfriend or fiance for him to meet them and soon discovers that things are a little different. They walk into what looks like a set piece from Dawn of the Planet of the Apes and looks around to find them and feel like something is off. Well, she does. Robin just thinks it's normal. They soon end up hiding in a cabin when someone enters and falls asleep on the bed. They escape, but suddenly the girlfriend gets choked to death by Piglet. Now this leads to the whole them trying to escape thinking something is wrong with Piglet. And when he sees Pooh, he thinks he's there to help but this is all a setup for him to be captured and soon he becomes a prisoner to these creatures. He soon sees basically uh, the remain, skeletal remains of Eeyore and watches his wife's corpse or fiance's corpse be burnt alive in fire and basically traumatized by it. Now, most questions I have from this point is mainly, what happened to Owl and Rabbit? Were they also eaten and did they escape? Because they don't get much context on what happens to them and the only characters we see in this is Pooh and Piglet. But this was only a matter, minor question related to some other ones I have coming up. So after the titles and the opening scene, we are then introduced to the main girl the group of women will be following now in this film and this is with Maria, who is dealing with a traumatic event which is very vague at first, thinking it was a bad breakup, an abusive relationship, or something similar. And the therapist suggests to get away for a while to find herself again, which leads to them going to a house in the woods for a weekend or for a few days. Now, they then cut to them all traveling down and stop at a garage for no reason, maybe for directions, but it's hard to tell, and then it cuts to them at the house. So basically the entire garage section was completely pointless. Short but later, we are introduced to another girl who's traveled down by her own, by herself, and then gets spotted by Pooh in the woods, and then chased into a sawmill, where she gets killed by being put through a wood chipper. She gets her head smashed in and basically shoved through a wood chipper. And in this moment, we see the level of visual effects in this movie, and some look alright. You'll see a little bit later, like a bit more of the graphical stuff. But when they show blood, it looks like non-finished rendering of the graphics of an early video game for, of liquid matter kind of thing. That's really essential. Anyway, back at the house, we learn of the traumatic event that Maria had an encounter with some peeping Tom watching her from a window. And that led to him some other night getting into her house and trying to undress her and soon discovers it is not his first attempt with her. So apparently, she either needed to lock her doors or he had a secret compartment to get into the house. I couldn't tell, they don't really delve into this much. 
Now, it's all thing that's never brought up again, and the rest of the film or even has some sense of resolving the issue by the end of it, as it really doesn't connect much to the narrative at all, but maybe to give some sense of depth to one of the characters, as most of them, in a sense, really just does have no development or characteristics at all. Anyway, you were probably wondering, what happened to Christopher? Well, he has been kept prisoner by those two animals and essentially tortured by them for months with Pooh whipping him with Eeyore's tail, taunting him with the charred skeleton of his girlfriend and being forced to be showered in her blood. Must say, this seems like a really more kinky NSFW fan fiction or Fifty Shades of Grey than Fifty Shades of Grey was. Also, there is a point I want to, uh, to bring up, but there is many points in this where it shows that Pooh is eating honey and it focuses on his face all the time and often drips out, making it look like he's just some form of drooling, like he's just gone feral, which they show it multiple times and it's very gross. Anyway, this soon leads to them discovering the girls in the cabin and heading over there to kill all of those that are human, because remember, they hate humanity. So we didn't have the case of the girls getting killed one by one, where the first one we see is in a hot tub by herself taking photos of herself and then soon leads to her being chloroformed and tied up on the road by the car and eventually getting her head crushed by the car wheel that's driven by Pooh. So apparently he can drive cars now. They then stalk the house of the remaining girls, painting threatening messages on the windows to tell them to get out and shit, you know, and soon getting into the house. Two of the girls of Zoe and Alice get cornered by Piglet and his sledgehammer where one of them gets killed by a single swing to the face where she could have easily had the chance of escaping from the pool. She's just wadding through it. She could easily just climb out. Sure, she might get hit in the back with it. I don't know. And then the other was knocked down and taken to their lair. Now, the other girls follow them to rescue Alice and where they also discover Christopher Robin where they free him and learn of another woman held captive who has her had her face scarred from Piglet. She tries to fight him, but is overwhelmed by both and is killed, and soon Pooh chases after the two of the three other girls, while one hides and gets to jump on Piglet. She then basically ties him up and essentially, I think, kills him or seriously wounds him, and it seems they may have a chance of escape, but Pooh hears this, returns, and kills the hidden girl, the hiding girl, by impaling a knife or a machete through her mouth and throat, basically leaving her pinned up on the wall. Now at this point, there's about... 10 minutes left. Yeah, there's basically not much to really focus on this movie. A lot of it is essentially just who and Piglet going around killing people. That's essentially all this movie is. We get a little context of character development in this anyway. And it basically is wrapping up. So the summary of what happens is as follows. So the two remaining girls come across a group of hunters who tried to help them and soon come into contact with that sinister old bear. They take him on at once and it doesn't feel anything. And he essentially one punch kills each of them where the bit where the first guy he bitch slaps, one of them so hard half of his, half the skin on his face gets taken off and it kills him. It's probably the funniest thing in it. The other bit is just where he just goes, he does like this really cool turn, it's a really funny turn look to me, I just find it funny. Another one where he just get, he just curb stomps the dude, and then one that magically just introduced in the film the last five minutes is that Pooh has supernatural powers where he can control an army of bees to attack and kill people and use it on the last fleeing hunter. This is real. They literally, he just literally is emphasizing he has supernatural powers in the last five minutes, doesn't give context and just continues like nothing happened. Now, with no hope, the remaining girls floor the car to knock Pooh down, but he somehow clings onto the bottom of the truck and tries to kill them instantly, and soon the car crashes and one of them gets dragged away and decapitated, leaving only Mabel left. Now, as she tries to get the car working again, she's also about to be killed by Pooh by being dragged out of it. But out of nowhere, Christopher Robin shows up and rams Pooh with another car, crushing him between both vehicles, presumably killing him. Now, all seems safe, but it seems Pooh may be immortal and escapes the car and has Maria by the neck. Now, Christopher Robin then pleads with Pooh to let her live and take him instead to be with him forever. And Pooh ponders on her for a few seconds and then speaks the single line that he has in this film of, No, and kills Maria. As the car burns behind him, he continues plunging a knife into Maria's corpse, even though she's dead. Christopher Robin runs off, and the film just ends there on a very messy film by just focusing on the burning car as it fades to black and rolls the credits. Now, is there anything in this that I say I would that I liked? Well, some minor things relating to design and a little of presentation. Most of my praise mainly goes to the look of the two design forms of Pooh and Piglet that has a sense of a Texas Chainsaw Massacre mixed with a beloved book character, and I think the design of the costumes looks good on both, and I think works on how anthropomorphic animals would look a bit like in this world. These are the case we're not seeing, you know, basically Pooh rocking it out, uh, rocking out with his cock out, you know, not got that emphasis. 
Now, another aspect as well is that this film is not too long and it comes in just around an hour and 20 minutes. But some gripe of it is that there's definitely noticeable points where they linger on a short uh, shots for a good bit too long or maybe stretched out to fit what they feel is a reasonable film length. And if those scenes were kind of removed or short and you're, you're getting about five to 10 minutes off of it, so probably about maybe an hour and 10 minutes, hour 15 at most. But they had to work what they got. I also appreciate the attempt at making such a likable, wholesome character into a silent murderous killer that has some sense of uncertainty. Tones. However, it does not weigh the issues with this film, and this comes with the plot feeling like this was taping two different films together and making it a full story that it feels mismatched, and it likes the characters that are killed. We barely have any sense of caring for them because we honestly have no idea, we don't know them much or care for their demise by their animal killers. If they had development, we knew them for more longer, maybe would feel a bit sympathy for them, but you know, we don't really get anything from it. If it was a case that they had given more development, of course, it relates to the issues, if they'll face with Pooh and Piglet, then maybe it would make more sense. But as it is, this attempt, while I appreciate the effort, is just way too convoluted and messy with paper, thin characters, and something that doesn't give much time to flesh out the concept. Now, just to score this film, I'll give it a 4, 4.5, probably around there. There is something, there are some okay elements in this, but it's just buried under a lot of problems. So is this the end of this form of the sinister old bear? Well, apparently not, as it seems the film did well with a good little bit of box office on a very small budget. It made about like $5 million on like a $100,000 budget. And what spawned from this is that we're getting a follow-up to with Blood and Honey 2. Now, I did mention this in one of my recent Weird My Newsroom episodes from a little, few weeks ago that is happening and that one will introduce two other members of the group. The first is with Owl making an appearance, even though he look more he looks more like a vulture to me in the photos I've seen. And the other because uh, they're entering public domain now is the bouncing bounding Tigger joining in the film as well. Now this has also spawned the case that Pooh has also started to be morphed into a popular horror icon as there is already two horror games based on Winnie the Pooh being made. One being a 2D game mixed with Dr. Mara, the kind of gameplay known as um, Winnie's Hole. Yeah, that's what it's called. And the other is just entitled Hundred Acre Wood with Pooh as a giant morph monster. And you're in a hunt to rescue Christopher Robin from the whole situation. It's also the start of turning children, childhood characters into classics, uh, into horror recreations, as he has planned film for both Bambi and Peter Pan in mind. So I may do this thing again down the line in the future. If you're interested, I make it a thing by liking and subscribing. So if you know you're interested, I could do it as a we we yearly thing of Halloween or something like that, but I have no idea. Well, that's the first film down. And and I was a, I was kind of surprised by it. Like, yeah, there's a lot of problems with it for sure, but I didn't think it was all too bad. It's like meh, it's meh but it's all right. Surely the second film can't be that bad, right? R right? Everyone, we have an announcement to make. Stop bullying! Now, like the previous film, I'm going to give some backstory to this next one. And in particular, this next one is a film known as Dear David. This is based on the concept of a long-running Twitter thread that happened around five or six years ago. The concept of the story was that there was a comic artist named Adam Ellis, who created this tale that he was essentially being haunted by a small child named David, who had an incident that left him with a big old dent in his head, like the image of, like the image you're going to see here. And over the course of a couple months, he gives us the tale of how he has experienced strange phenomena from the rocking chair in his room, rocking back and forth to seeing strange things happen in his apartment complex. They witness this as well as his cats. Seeing things through his door people and being left tired through the night trying to find answers to his situation. Now all is said and good but it becomes much more unsettling when he has some really creepy and well established images to go alongside it that make it feel genuine. Which I'm gonna throw up a bit here as you can clearly see. Like if you wanted like a really good explanation of like the a really in-depth version of it I would suggest uh, the YouTube channel Rainbot. They did a really good free part series focusing on it. There's, there's plenty of videos you can check out online of it. It's, it's a really good story. I honestly think it's a really good scary story. Now, as mentioned, basically, this happened over the course of about three to five months. It might be a bit longer, but I have no idea. And it is worth where it all ends. But, of course, I wouldn't be talking about this today if it was just that. Because this so-called film tries to do with this story. Now, there has been a case that a story from a Twitter thread was made into a film to great success with a film known as Zola. Yet, they couldn't even do that. And the pinpoint reason why is to who is the one behind it. I'm going to watch the second worst reviewed movie of this year, which is Dear David. And there's always a reason why this is a problem. Yes, this is a BuzzFeed Studios movie. And it's the team behind the case. I believe the artist was from BuzzFeed at the time. Maybe still, but I have no idea. 
And this is where the case of it really starts to take a lot of focus as it feels very much like a BuzzFeed advertisement more than a more than this horror story. But I'm getting a little too far ahead of myself and I'll address the plot summary first before I delve into the spoilery plots uh, summary. So the plot of this film is, after responding to internet trolls, a man becomes haunted by the ghost of a dead child named David based on the viral Twitter thread of BuzzFeed comic artist Adam Ellis. So as you can tell, the plot for this has been slightly altered to try and make it the case of how the child came to haunt the artist by the case that he was a demon because he was cyberbullied for sharing his art. Is this a movie case where fucking David is really a, a sentient being because he was cyberbullied? And I wish I was joking on that, because this is how it ended up, how it all starts off. I also want to emphasize, this is also apparently emphasized that this is based on a true story, which is complete bullshit. This is based on a Twitter thread. It's not based on a true story. Anyway, we are then introduced to Adam as he uploads a new art piece and we see the comments on it as he heads to work at BuzzFeed, a place that we'll pretty much see a good portion of this movie, because I'm pretty sure it's nearly more of a marketing ploy. It's relatable AF. It's just the last part. Not as great. Your reach is kind of lame. It's not a criticism. It's just something to consider. What I feel is going to be somewhere in this f***ing list is going to be a reason I left BuzzFeed video going to happen in this. We see some of his co-workers who tell him to not give in to the trolls, and then we meet the boss that tells him to take stories from other publications and make it as their own method. Then he does some report to Adam, and he tells him that he has the aura of relatable AF which is literally what he actually says in the film. This is where I bring up a bit of a major annoyance of this film and that the writing is very rough that will try to be relatable and topical words from about five or six years ago, and it just makes me cringe-inducing to sit through. Anyway, while this goes on, we, g we go to two kids who are simply messing in chat rooms as catfishing people and soon are put into contact with David. So now he's an urban legend, I think. Well, they do that. They basically ask three questions, and soon one of them dies from something sho shoving a hand down his throat and making him piss himself. Basically, the dear David emphasizes that he will die in his bed, uh, choking on his own breath and pee himself. That's basically what he emphasizes. So, yeah, you can basically tell what the hell's going on with this movie. Now, back to Adam. He is working away on his stuff and soon gives in, has a drink and starts calling out some trolls before he is suddenly contacted by ghost account David himself. And soon he starts to message and follow him and everything like that. God. Now, things from here start to happen that soon lead to him starting to experience things in the night, where he ends up in a trippy version of his room where he cannot leave his bed and sees a rocking chair across the room, rocking back and forth, and soon over the next night or two of seeing David in the chair, where he will also have provided asking him the first question. Oh no, he's about to be haunted by the demon because he trolled people on the internet. Oh no. It's the scary, it's the scary rocking chair. Run for it. Now over time, one of his co-workers helps him from lack of sleep by helping him research on some sort of paranormal experience and also for company, as his partner is away caring for his mom and having that sense of feeling distant as it seems to not be able to respond properly to him. Now, what I emphasize here as well is, is a point. They introduce this whole thing of like a co-worker friend as well as a partner for Adam. They never really emphasize this in the plot, in the original thread. It's really just focused on Adam and his whole ordeal in the situation. Now, at this point as well in time, he moves upstairs to the room above as the neighbors had moved upstate, so he moves up there to escape it, but it seems to still persist with him falling him up there and messing with his mind and his cats who seem to send someone at the other side of the door and seeing things through the peephole and taking photos with a polaroid with some odd circumstances that soon lead to him creating the start of the tread. Bunny, what's your fight to me, huh? Now over the next, like, stint, the boss of BuzzFeed thinks this is all a random concept unbeknownst that Adam is essentially having a crisis and being haunted by a demon child with a dent in his head. It's totally happening. It's rad too. I like how you're bringing that back. It's like so they're trying to publicize a whole thing that basically this is just an elaborate story setup, which basically it was. 
but they're making out the case that a true haunting in this situation. Of course. Go ahead. Uh, it's just, it's very head wrecking. It's, it's. What? They essentially market the fuck out of it with BuzzFeed articles and suggest a whole method of exorcism on the apartment and putting salts in the door, but that doesn't work and David gets in the room, basically by becoming a, uh, a cloud of gas, nearly chokes him by his aura and then whacks him in the head with a typewriter after asking the second question. What just happened there? Soon after reawakening, he hears noises downstairs and comes across his partner Kyle, who has a bit of a confrontation with him after not hearing from Adam when Adam says he tried to call, but unbeknownst to Adam, Kyle called him multiple times when he is not seen. It leads to a case of having time away from each other when Kyle accuses Adam of cheating, when Grinder appears back on his phone, and when he doesn't remember doing so, or even messaging a lot of hot guys. Are we having a domestic right now with this movie? This wasn't in the original Fred. So essentially, David is manipulating his tech to push people away from Adam to really destroy everything and ruin your life, and that sense leads to him becoming more isolated from his peers. Now this leads to the next night, where instead of being trapped on his bed, he's taken to a new location where he witnesses how he ends up with a big old bump on his noggin, cause David was looking at questionable imagery and his dad sees it. Don't we all hate that when you're looking at questionable imagery and your dad walks in? That kid's fucking strong if he's dragged that, mother, that huge ass grown adult man out of a bed. Why does the young David look a bit like that, uh, that guy that reviews, uh, reviews food on the internet? David goes nuts and tries to strangle his dad. Mom sees it and then nearly kills the son by bashing him in the head with something that gives him the big old bump on his head. What this leads to is Adam literally gone to the level of being completely broken, feeling everyone seems to be against him, that supposedly people are mad at him for certain messages and voice recordings where he doesn't remember sending them. Been feeling isolated and lacking in sleep. So of course, the BuzzFeed boss has the idea of making it multimedia, because that's what he thinks is the best way to do it, and to find, find a way to end this story. Which shows Adam looks dead inside and sees it's not a problem, but someone who has been working very hard. I know the feeling. From there, he tries to call his partner again and make effort to open up to him, which is a thing that apparently he fails to do, and to ask him to help find the source of breaching the data of the David account, so we'll see how much of an effort is made on that later. Now he first gets, I think, a medium that makes the assumption we already know that there is negative energy around the rocking chair, and that the computer, so no surprise there, and then feels he's get a more of a better fix from an internet sleuth that tells him of yet another new character to this expansive world that is known as Loopy Linda, a character that was never emphasized in the original threat. Is this, is this situation in case that they're introducing another deity into this? Yep, they're introducing a third person to this. Another one, Loopy Linda. Never brought up in the original story. This whole thing turns out to be David's mom, who leads to him finding out the name of like David's surname and discovering that he was been he's just woken up from a 21 year coma. He goes to the hospital where he was basically located for 21 years and is told that he's dead. So what? Where the fuck is he getting this information from? And then basically because he's a bit of a dick, he he takes one of the doctor's cards, sneaks into his office, and discovers he is dead and the body has been taken or missing from the morgue. So I have no idea what the hell someone's doing with a body and finds the info for the doctor that analyzes Linda and the checks the status of David and goes to her house. He gets there, the door is left open in the dark house, he finds documents of David on a desk and some disturbing images and drawings of how that kid earlier was killed. That's just randomly left in the middle of a house. Okay. He then goes looking for the doctor, but surprise, she's also dead by being hung from the stairs. Does the whole weird eyes wide open stuff and scares him enough to run out of the house. Now at this point I've lost a sense of reasoning on this film and it becomes tedious in the last, I'm guessing it was like 20 minutes of this film. But let me get through this. Okay, so once he leaves the house he, go, he gets home and tries to stay up for the night by being 
on a sugar boost and caffeine so David can't get him to sleep. So I'm questioning, has he just basically become Freddy Krueger at this point? I don't know. It basically emphasized him making it out like it is. So I'm gonna prove him wrong. I'm gonna stay up all night if I have to. Well, it doesn't last as he falls asleep and David appears on the TV and makes Adam cut himself with a knife that he suddenly has in his hand. Yo, man, this show's born. But he stops it when Adam calls Kyle in his dream, which is weird because I'm pretty sure from scientific fact that we never question why we don't have a phone in a dream, but I don't know. So then he returns to work, his work colleague is mad at him for messages he didn't send, and then another worker beside him gets getting help on something and thinks he have sent him the most vile list from BuzzFeed of the 10 reasons to off oneself. I didn't write these. I didn't write these. So the ghost is basically manipulating him to where he cut his wrists. Basically, he's been hacked his phone to start messaging people, put him on grinder, all sort of weird shit. Guess this is how everyone lead, quits BuzzFeed. I don't fucking know. Which to him having a breakdown in the office and the boss stopping him and saying to take some time off and care for yourself for himself. Basically the whole thing was how to uh, best to live yourself instead of best to um, kill yourself. At the same time, Kyle responds again, amongst mad at some voice notes that the David account doesn't exist. This leads to Adam spiraling, making art based on getting rid of David, uh, mixed with dumb generic negative comments from just, you know, basically how the internet works. Yo, fuck this, fuck this rocking chair. I'm angry towards furniture. And in the process, he accidentally asks David a third question when David morphs one of his pieces to make him do so and now he's screwed. But I bet you're wondering how he does this screw him over. Well, he somehow creates some form of other being that controls him as a video game character form with a knockoff controller and makes him pour himself uh, in liquor and sets him alight to really make him die in a fire. The fuck? Who the f who the fuck is this? <laughs> okay, what the fuck is happening? Something is a video game movie now. What the fuck is going on? This leads to him confronting David in some void and tells him that this is his punishment for being mean and then some other people he knows make the most generic and cringy insults. So like, you know, the top 10 list of why Adam is a piece of shit kind of thing. You know, that's basically I think one of the lines. Like, I've lost point of like what is even going on anymore. What is happening? Then back in the real world, David appears and attacks Adam in his burning complex. They have a fight and Adam overpowers him and finally kills him with, I believe, the internet router. This fucking I am legend looking ass bitch. That looks really wrong. <laughs> In the process, his partner and co-worker come in to rescue him and they get him to safety, as well as the cats. The cats are safe, don't worry, no cats were harmed in this. And they finally realize he was telling the truth. When they see his phone that was possessed by David, and now he is dead, it is all fixed. And then in the back of the ambulance, he apologizes and says he will be more open, while flashing a final look at David in the window before the ambulance drives away. Now you think that is the end of it, but no. It cuts to a female streamer talking on the story, trying to make it a little bit of a meta kind of thing. Dear David, is it because your parents tried to cancel you? David. Soon enough, David ends up entering her chat. She answers three questions and then starts slamming her head so hard on the desk multiple times that it starts to cut, uh, starts to bleed blood so much that it cuts to black after her screaming. And then the film ends there, and that basically as the end of a very tough watch.
I actually feel nothing after this. This movie was bad. Like, how do you screw up an actually really good Twitter account? Like, you could have made it like Zola, an actual good film based on a Twitter thread. Well, at least I don't have to watch this anymore. Now just to make the video on it. Now, I'll have to say, ask if there's anything good in this film, and there is very little, I will say, unfortunately. If you know for a lot of things, and what you may know of, as I mentioned, I give a lot of things the benefit of the doubt, but this one felt tacked on and barely really followed the story. They had potential in making it like the form of keeping it mysterious and more unsettling, instead of using the basic generic horror tropes for everything from jump scares to backstories to all that stuff it makes it even more tedious. Like, they could have made this more a case of like a paranormal activity or found footage kind of film, and that would have been really good. I would honestly think a found footage version would have been much better, but I guess they had to just make something of it. Now, I will say when they do do some of the elements of the actual thread and follow it, there seem, it seems fine, but adding things to it make it feel blood, it just doesn't work. And they make up the case that David dies, yet in the thread he's still alive and in the end, so I guess he had to make up something to end it with. It also doesn't help that it's bloated more with random side stories and relationship issues, but I guess it is to help give them some character development, so I'll give that over Blood and Honey. That didn't give much in the development of character, but it's still not much of a major development that if it was trimmed down a little bit or worked more on focusing on the actual Fred story, then I feel it may have worked more or to make it sure than it. They may have helped it. Also, want to address the most overused aspect in this thing, and that is of course the sheer marketing placement of BuzzFeed in this film. That is honestly makes it so much more tedious that they are present for most of the film when it's never brought up in general in the actual original story. I don't think it ever is in the original story. Now I know it's the case that it's a story from an artist from BuzzFeed, but it needs to be said that overdoing it makes it more annoying. But overall, I would give this film probably a 2, two, two out of 5. I was thinking it was going to be a bit of a tough watch, but even I had a point of wondering, do I continue watching this? And I felt dragged out as more of a mark to for BuzzFeed and a story of somewhat an eerie Fred. If it followed more on the piece or given a better chance, maybe I would have given a better score, but that's basically what I give for this anyway. Ghosts! <laughs> Ghosts! So to just wrap up this piece in general, what did I learn from this entire experience? Well, I will say the case that horror can be quite the challenging subject and similar to other genres will not appeal to everyone. When there is a sense of trying to honor something or experiment with it, I could see the appeal and appreciate the effort. I see some sense over the last few years that there is some effort made and some creative minds that are either starting out with making something or from those you would not expect them to make in that genre coming along and making something that can turn out really well. Example is like Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele is known for being a comedian, but then he came along and made Get Out, Us, and Nope, which are all really great films. I really love those movies. Now, it's also a case that you have some as well that may may not have the best start, but there's still an effort to them and they will approve over time. Now, I know the case that I have bashed both of these movies in this piece, but I can see that there may at some point been some attempt to be made or that I could see the potential from the final product. Now, I appreciate the effort and concept made of making something that was wholesome and make it much more of a messed up concept. But if given the chance with the follow of developing the world and the characters more and more of a creative kills, then I could see it being something that could turn into a great little series. They have emphasized the budget's going up bigger, so it's going to be much more bloodier. It's going to kill about 30 odd peoples, and it's going to probably hopefully be more of a character development. So I'll see how that one turns out. As for the other one, what this felt a bit like was a little too close to being overshadowed by the studio making it, and I feel if given the attempt by a different studio or creator and make much more closer and faithful to the original concept, then it could work a whole lot more. As I see the potential making the story is of something great eventually. It needs to be more done from some upcoming creative or in the tone similar to some of those really creative analog horrors like the back rooms, the Mandela catalog, or even like the FNAF VHS tapes. Those are really good ones to make something cool and unique out of it. But as things stand on both, they were simply some films I sat through that I think have potential with another go around. But if done poorly again, that I wouldn't bother and don't plan to watch them again anytime soon at all. Unless I'm forced, but I have no idea. Now, if you enjoyed enjoyed this piece and want to see more, let me know in the comments down below of what other bad films to watch in particular. Now it's a case, if it's overly gory, I may have to, you know, sit through them 
I don't know if I'll survive for him because I have a really bad hemophobia. This is like a fear of intense blood and gore, but I'll figure something out. And if you have seen these two films in particular as well, let me know your thoughts on them in the comments below. As always, I hope you all enjoyed listening to me rambling of all things media. Uh, you all stay being wonderful people and a great day every day. And of course, as it's the month of the spooky season, as the time this video comes out, I wish you all a very happy Halloween and I hope you all stay safe out there as well and you know get plenty of candy and watch a lot of scary stuff you know watch some good stuff maybe some bad stuff as well you know if you want a good laugh anyways that's all i have for now and i'll see you all in the next video so goodbye everybody and take care <laughs>